All right, thank you very much. I am very happy to be here. And I did not come from far, just from Uptown, from Columbia University. I am one of the trailblazers. I'm not a faculty, I'm a research scientist. And then I'm also representing not just the regular academia, but a large international collaborative research type fraction of the academia, which is actually large. So I'm very glad that I can feed back to how to engage more academics uh, in open source hardware. So I actually built the timing system together with a lot of colleagues within uh, LIGO, the Laser, Inter Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, which discovered gravitational waves from not us, but colliding black holes and also neutron stars a few years ago. And we use an interferometer uh, to do that. So how does that work and what is that interferometer? So actually we have a very large installation, not just one, there are two uh, within the United States. This is the Hanford site. Uh, those tubes over there, those lines, they are actually vacuum tubes four kilometers long, okay? And there is an installation of very complex optical elements, mirrors, which need to work and move in unison to be able to detect a displacement of 10 to the minus 19 meters, okay? Mind boggling. So all those mirrors, everything, everything, and also the data which we timestamp, they really need precise timing, and that's what I worked on. And everything is open source in the sense that you can go to LIGO Document Control Center and find not just our timing system, but everything what LIGO built, or nearly everything what LIGO built. Uh, and uh, there's a public interface. Of course, there comes the next. Uh, why I'm here, because there's one thing you can find something if you really want to. Uh, can you really build it again if you want to, or you would ever need it? Can you use it for other things? And how is it easy, difficult to do that? So this is what I work. Uh, with, with students uh, in the past year as one of the fellows. So, of course, open science is very important for our collaboration. We are actually publishing papers and scientific results, like, you know, those colliding black holes. Uh, and, of course, the data is also public, not right away, take 18 months or so. And we are actually making our software available through, and the data available through uh, Open Science Center, Gravitational Wave Open Science Center. You can go there, find our data, and actually even software to analyze the data with it. And of course, on the left side, what you see, we also have hardware. And while we always put science first, <laughs> It's really based on the foundation of the hardware. All of our results, we even have those amazing discoveries without this. So, uh, you know, but everybody finds that most important. This is at the bottom. I used large fonts to show that we wouldn't have that without this. So what are those hardwares? Well, they could be optics. Uh, this is uh, one of the vacuum chambers inside, okay? <laughs> All right, uh, this is one of the uh, seismic isolation platforms. It's not in the vacuum chamber yet. Uh, and this is one of the timing boards which we had at the Columbia. Okay, uh, there are hundreds of these and so on. And this is the LIGO document uh, control center where you can go and, you know, search. Not easy, I have to admit that. Uh, NSF funded our project and everything is, uh, actually I want to say go this way, everything is uh, available because there was an NSF mandate and that's why you find these, all these things. I worked with three collaborations, not just with, with, with LIGO and actually LIGO, it's not only LIGO, we have Virgo and Congra, there are several detectors worldwide, we need each other in order to actually tell which direction a given event we detected came from. Timing is used in that, proper timestamp. And as a scientist, I also work with other collaborations because my data on this side of the work is something which is called My Time Messenger Astronomy. I am actually connecting information which are coming from several different 
uh, instruments, different channels. This is a new thing, you know that actor. So Alicia, I don't know whether he, you are here. I actually know people who work at the South Pole, <laughs> okay? <laughs> Although I don't know whether they would. <laughs> okay, all right, so that's Ice Cube. Uh, I am very heavily involved with that. I'm doing the joint search. This is another uh, team which I actually also looked information from. This is Veritas. This is a much smaller team. LIGO, Virgo, Kaga together is way over 2,000, Ice Cube 300 or so. International, all of these, many different continents. And Veritas is dozens, okay? Uh, so what you see, we have different academic teams spanning many cultures, continents, Etc. The background is, is we are academics, but we do have, especially within our staff and engineering uh, parts who came from the industry and sometimes from national laboratories. So there is that type of variety. Of course, the age group is, is uh, sometimes we even have high school interns, right? Uh, the project is decades long. So everything which we build, it needs to be sustainable for a long time. And we have very specific scientific goals. So the collective experience from this team, and this is why I went out and interviewed colleagues in these collaboration who have been doing hardware, it's like centuries long. So it's nice to listen to them and see whether they know about open source hardware. Uh, are they really doing anything like that? What's the awareness? Do they have any feedback to us? And why certain things are just not gaining traction yet? Because we do transform science. That I am certain. I mean, transfer science with gravitational wave detection a few years ago. I, I mean, it's totally new. But we are, we also just, at least due to the large size, we influence how we do science in academia. Okay? All right. So who is doing hardware? Well, on the right side, that's me doing hardware. I am a research scientist, as I said. This is actually doesn't look like that, but it's one of the timing racks at the, I think at the Hanford side. Uh, but we also have a lot of other people doing science. The, I mean, hardware. This is Alexa. She was one of our grad students many years ago at one of the optical tables. Uh, I have Seth here putting together timing chassis. He was an undergrad when he, this picture was taken but he stayed with us as a grad student. He defended his thesis a few weeks ago, so yay. Uh, <laughs> and of course, sometimes we don't know who is doing that science, like on this picture, I can't tell who is there. It's probably a, another, uh, probably a postdoc, a staff, one of the research scientists faculty, maybe in the summer, you may find them in a bunny suit if we are at the stage of, 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 of constructing something, but I actually don't know who are on these pictures. <laughs> okay, so what are the uh, hardware contributions of all these teams whom I talked to, to the project? Of course, it goes from electronics, optics, mechanical, vacuum design, but let me put one more thing which is there, and it's very important for our community, and it's not just in LVK, but also for Ice Cube. We are always doing some testing and commissioning when we're upgrading the detector. We're using a hardware a lot. Maybe you didn't build it, but you commission it. You really need to know everything about that hardware. And there are a lot of people who are interacting with hardware on a way that they are analyzing the data to assess the hardware's performance and reliability to diagnose instrument failure. They may have not ever touched the hardware, but they are interacting with them. So I was getting feedback from these people because they are really understanding how to test the hardware, at least on the incoming data level. Okay, these are very important people in our community and basically around two thirds of those who responded to my questions uh, were doing this, not just this, many of them also designed the hardware, but some of them were doing this as their sole purpose. So this is a very important point in designing hardware, which is reliable that we have. Uh, this is an important function. Okay, so does our community do hardware outside of academic research? There is a measurable interest, okay? Not much time to design something new. And usually it's like repeat. 
repair and fix. And sometimes if they use open source, it's like household monitoring, automotive, solar tracking. These are the examples. I put an example of retro computing and all the needs are everywhere. So if somebody is telling, oh, I asked for examples, what you're doing, which is, you know, open source, uh, that's the first thing which came up. All right which may not be that surprising. So what's the awareness of open source science and hardware in our uh, community? So this is many years ago, you probably seen this PhD comics about open software, right? Don't worry, you don't have to start your code from scratch. You can just reuse the software, but add the instructions. It's a code commented block. So this is these are the similar questions we can have about hardware. And I don't think we are here with the software. We are we know what we are doing. There's open software, we use it very frequently, it's really available. We are relying it so much with the hardware. This is where we are, at least in LIGO. We make it open, but we're not really making it open on a way that, and that's what I'm going to tell you, that is uh, so easily usable. But what's the perception, as I said, everybody's using software, right? Uh, data less frequently, open hardware, not much, more often for hobby than anything else. And... <laughs> The importance, which is most important, well, software. This is what I get back from the, and hardware is much less. And the emphasis in recent years has been more on open data. This is partially because of uh, NSF dictate. This is the way our community feels. Open hardware, like, there is a, some measurable response, but not really. They don't think there's an, em uh, an emphasis on that in our community. It's growing. So, you know, most of the people say that uh, the, there may be other use cases for the hardware they build if we do some modification, but there are some, and it's a measure about some, who say it's so specific that they couldn't see any external use. But then I got a few responses who said they were the modification for outside use, and one actually said they certified. I don't know whether it's Roshvai. I need to see this to figure out that and get more feedback. Uh, now, this is the next thing. Well, who are the target audiences for open hardware? And this is what I get from our committee. We think we are, there is a bottom over there. I don't know why it's not doing it, general public. Yeah, this is the order. We think we are writing and making our open, uh, our hardware, okay, for ourselves, our scientists. And, if I had asked that maybe ourselves, are you writing those documentations on open heart on your hardware for yourself, which you are submitting to LIGO DCC, maybe they would have chosen it as number one because they need to go back five years and know where they find it. And they don't think that anybody else would ever care. So this is really helpful for recognizing and diagnosing why we are not doing more yet. Because we're thinking, we're writing our documentations for ourselves, right? So let me show you something about the documentation. I put together what the documentation scheme was for the atomic system. I, I'm just showing that this exists, it's complicated, but there is a lot of primary final design and the reviews and all these documents are all available, very difficult to connect them and find them on LIGO DCC, but everything is there. And if you really want to make any of the boards, the Google files are there. There are even test documents. And if you have our team designer and our test documents, because this is an old project, we started the design in 2007. If you want to actually use our test documents, which actually requires you to download test, uh, uh, test code to the FPGA, you would need an our team designer 2009, okay? <laughs> to do the test, but you could do it if you had it, okay? And I can prove you that actually it's doable because our students did it. So I also asked the students, you know, whether they are aware, or not just this, not the students, everybody in the corporation, whether they are aware of that the documents are public. Around half of them are not aware that they are writing those public documents. <laughs> Quite amazing, right? So obviously, then I got a lot of interesting responses about what they think there are about the barriers for, for uh, you know, our hardware to be gaining traction and being, 
you know, actually used to some extent by outside community. Obviously, the biggest barrier, what I said, that they think it's too specific, right? Uh, but also, there was a comment, and I just mentioned that our documents are not organized in a way that we can actually find them. The connection between the documents easily. So we are not doing it on Git, and that was one of the things which we tried with the students because then a project is actually together. All right. So, and there was another interesting response, which I, I and I'm just showing examples I got, that we should actually create some simplified versions for the general public, and I think this is a great idea. We are doing this about our scientific papers, and but easy to write a science library. And it's not that easy to, at least in a small subfraction of our hardware, to create something which the general public could use. But we are doing uh, demonstrations, uh, science festivals, and so on. So for those cases, I think we can definitely do that. And uh, I think we can have uh, uh, some impact, which actually maybe some use case scenarios which are additional or at least in the education about awareness of our science and what hardware means for our science okay so and then i have to tell this comment because this is close to my heart so in science and with hardware we are creating so much landfill because if something breaks most people throw it away because they don't know how to fix it and you don't have the documentation how to fix it. So there was this comment that uh, partially because of this, we need to have not just careful troubleshooting guides, but guides, but also even detailed test, test documentations for open source hardware, everything. So this is about feedback from our community to you to give how would you test the hardware you which you made uh, that it actually worked works well i mean this is their impression i'm just the messenger here okay uh, so i asked what makes open source uh, projects successful and i am gonna go very quickly the top means 4.6 out of 5 documentation that is easy to find online and i'm gonna go back uh, bottom is certification by an organization body 2.8 <laughs> Sorry, guys. Uh, I really, we are, but but look at number two, ability and right to repair. I kind of think that the certification can have on the second most important part, an ability and right to repair. So I think Oshawa with the certification. Uh, emphasis is doing something good, and I am going to have to communicate this back to our community that that will help with the ability and right to repair. Okay, certainly the ability. All right, so you can look at all these things, uh, quite interesting uh, as well, but this was the order of importance I received. So, recommendations. Uh, I have, I think, two more slides, or, you know, something like that. So, we need to increase the awareness of open source hardware in the, within our community. Uh, we need to have set documentation guidelines. Uh, we need to have open source hardware friendly design guidelines like use key CAD instead of our team designer and things like that. Uh, we do have our community a tremendous experience with open software. We can learn and adopt and create a similar community which happens in uh, open software. Uh, I think our community is not really aware of, I mean, international large science community is not really aware of what's being done in terms of a community development in open source hardware, but uh, they want to see a community, okay? And of course, when I ask, should best practices, guidelines for open source design be taught in academia as part of the curriculum in an overwhelming yes? So this is a feedback to actually our universities. Uh, most of these yes is coming from the students as well. My students also say that. So we need to teach undergraduates, even just how to open Git issues and put their work on GitHub and uh, about licenses. And of course, uh, you know, we have to teach them through 
it makes sense to stitch them through open source uh, projects. So next thing which I did was a small exercise with the students, and some of them are here. Uh, these are Columbia students and a set of high school students. And the question was, how long is a project? How to deal with obsolete parts, parts shortage replacements, and so on. And it, do we find anything which is not open source friendly? How we are going to deal with that? So we are finishing this exercise now. Uh, one team finished, the other team is still uh, trying to uh, go back. But this is what we found that, of course, uh, this is an old project. There were a few custom made components, not feasible for us. Well, what are we, uh, open source hardware? long lead times, expensive, and so on. It's not really something we can uh, easily replace. But I asked the students to try to do their best, find substitutes. They did it sometimes. The FPG was basically obsolete. But they actually transferred the <laughs> uh, files to, to KiCad and performed some tests on some existing boards. And uh, we also found some issues with legacy software and all, all, all the have which comes with that. We do have the student feedback mentoring training needs in academia. Uh, it's a kind of document which we are writing. We have been overleaf and as part of our project. And we would like to publish it. And these are the themes, everybody. Some of the students are here in this room. And this is the thank you so much. And I have the two teams there. Uh, Arushima Luk, Melinda Sani are the college teams. Alex Daniel, Jeremiah, Leo, Ray, Tony, and, and their teacher, Dr. Matone, is the high school team. And everybody, uh, thank you so much for being here. And uh, really appreciate the invitation and the fellowship.